new episode of the Financial Confessions. It's me, your girl, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves to talk about money. And today I am here with a guest that I've really been looking forward to having back on the show. She was notably here for an episode that I've listened to twice, but never watched because it's uh, the worst haircut I've ever had in my life (laughs) on the episode that we did together. I look like Melon Cat. I had that haircut for literally a week and my husband was like, this has to go. I can't. I don't know if I can feel the same way about you as I usually do with that haircut. So suffice to say, um, I encourage you to go back and listen to our first interview, but uh, black out your screen so you can't see me. This episode is sponsored by Quince. Shop high quality luxury items without luxury prices. Go to quince.com slash TFC to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash TFC. And thanks to Delete Me for supporting TFC. Remove your personal info from data broker websites. And we have a special discount for you. Get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeletemecom slash TFC and use promo code TFC. But in all seriousness, I wanted to have this guest back because not only is she, I would say, one of the reigning queens of personal finance, she is also just such a cool woman all around, someone I love talking to about topics that go way beyond money. We're cooking up some cool stuff on that front that you'll hear more about later. Um, and also, it's just like she's a snappy dresser. She's a chic mom. She like She brings a lot to the table. And notably, she brings this brand new book that just came out October 3rd, A Healthy State of Panic, which, among other things, features me uh, talking about my choice not to have children. Um, But it's all about fears and using them to propel us into the life that we deserve to have. So uh, enough of my rambling. Let's get to our guest, Farnoosh Charavi. Hi, Chelsea. First of all, did you call me chic? Please. Coming from the... From the chicest woman on the this side of the oh, planet, really. Please, you're well. That's and I remember hard. that bad hair day, not because I remember it as a bad hair day, but because you were distraught. I was. Okay, you were distraught. Listen, I, <laughs> I assume. So I think that any time a woman gets like very blunt bang, she's going through some sort of mental crisis. Yeah. And I like watch. Mo- oh no! I'm sorry, our producer behind the camera has blunt bangs. Were you in a crisis when you yeah, cut I them? Myself, my mom was yeah. See? Okay. The theory stands. Now I always think of Fleabag that, I, that you know, that's yes. where the sister gets the, like, the pencil. I look like a pencil. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she did, and she, but she kind of asked for it. <laughs> she did ask for it. Um, but suffice to say, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for being here. So obviously I teed up the book a tiny bit, but tell us about it. Thank you. This is my fourth book after nine years of not writing a book. I think I had PTSD after that, you know, really? writing, writing books is hard, as you know. And I think also in the ne- last nine years, I've been podcasting and I've been doing different things and I didn't really have anything else to say about money, which is probably why this book isn't really about money. It's a book about uh, my childhood growing up as the daughter of Iranian immigrants and fear being very present uh, in our household. My parents say they intentionally raised me to be afraid because that's how they felt they could keep me on the straight and narrow, out of danger, protected. And I don't recommend this as a parenting style, but I can now in my 40s appreciate that foundation. I had to have a very early on uh, understanding of fear and how to work with it as opposed to combating it. And so when I wrote this book, I wanted it to be part memoir, part guidebook, offering readers a way to think about fear differently, as for me, it's been a tool. Tell me a little bit more in practicality what allowing fears to guide you looks like. Like, what does that mean? It means that when you, and I focused on nine different fears in the book. So this isn't a book about how all fear all the time can be useful. Like, we all have phobias. This book isn't about phobias. It's about when you have that really sort of nagging, adrenaline, tapping on the shoulder, inner fear at life's crossroads where the stakes are high, dealing with things pertaining to money, family, your career, your health, your livelihood, that when you are scared in those moments, it can be an opportunity to ask the fear questions. And by asking the fear questions, I mean really asking yourself questions, right? So why am I scared? Where is this fear coming from? I'm a journalist, so I like to ask a lot of questions and I bring that to this practice of working with fear. Asking it questions like, where did you come from? Are you real? Or are you something that I inherited and I attached onto myself because of the external world telling me that I should be afraid of this thing? Um, 
What do you want me to protect? What do you want me to look out for? Should I take a pause? I mean, look, if you are afraid before you do something big with your money, maybe you should stop and think about what you're about to do. That fear is a protective is a protective signal in our bodies. It's an abundant resource in our bodies, especially right now. In its in the primitive era, fear was really there to help us protect ourselves from death and protect our lives. And I think as we've evolved, fear has evolved. And fear not only shows up when it's a life or death moment, but potentially when our livelihoods are at stake. The things that we really care about, the things that we want to execute and create in our lives because that's how we define success or fulfillment. And that's how you do it. You have to ask fear questions with that information. You use it to the go, go make the decisions that you want to make. I present as fearless a lot in my, in my world. And so do we all, but that doesn't mean that I'm not having a relationship with fear. It's not that it doesn't mean that I didn't have, you know, a, a conversation with fear first. Chances are, if you see me on stage talking to 500 people, that can be scary, but it's because ahead of that, I knew what was at stake and I prepared for it. The fear was like, you might screw up. So I went ahead and I prepared and I made sure that I did a tech run and all the things. And that's a very simple example, but in also in, in real life, in, in real sort of more layered situations, like with relationships or money, um, it never hurts to listen to your fears and kind of take a step back and go, how can I do that thing over there that kind of seems scary, whether that's investing or buying that house or getting married or leaving the job while protecting what's important to me, feeling like I will be successful um, because I've done X, Y, and Z. What do I, what's the work that I need to do? And fear is just a great way to kind of stop and recognize that about yourself, that you want to protect yourself from something. You talk a lot in the book about your experience as, you know, growing up as the daughter of Iranian immigrants and, you know, a lot of sort of the messages you received and the things that you internalized. And we have had a fair amount of people on the show who come from a similar background and talk about kind of the mixed blessing of that and the both the good and bad that came from it in terms of the way they navigate the world. Um, I was actually, I had dinner last night with a friend of mine who is the daughter of an immigrant who she was recently helping her mother um, with some work stuff. Her mother's a cashier at CVS. She's 62. And she found out in helping her mother navigate the portal for healthcare stuff that her mom makes $30,000 a year at 62. And she was saying how what upsets her about that, that she knows that that's how her mother values and sees herself. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, you know, growing up, there was such a heavy premium put on the education I get, the job I get, the ways in which I succeed, and that there was never sort of a freedom to see or pursue yourself beyond those very kind of specific paradigms, um, which again is something that we hear from a lot of first gen people who come on the show. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? Mm -hmm. I write about my mom a lot in this book. Um, and as I think a lot of mother daughter relationships, it's complex, it's highly layered. And like, if I was to write this book 20 years ago, it would be a different take on my mom. But now in my forties, I'm a mom now. I have a lot more compassion for, everything that she did for me. And I didn't always maybe see it that way. I always thought maybe she was like not doing her best. Um, but now in retrospect, I, rem you know, my mom was, I think like a lot of immigrant women to this country, they come here young. They're probably already moms or my mom was 19 when she had me. She didn't have a college degree. She had just graduated from high school. She didn't speak the language. She didn't have a license. She didn't have money. My dad was basically her economic blanket. And uh, and I was there, and she was terrified. She was a terrified woman, as I probably would have been also. Right. And the thing about my mom is that she had so many – I mean, the reason they were in America was because they wanted their children and themselves to have better lives. But I think that the emphasis on – on the children was greater than on themselves. And no one ever said to my mom, what are your hopes and dreams? Yeah. And then the follow-up to that, which is great, let me help you. We've all had those moments probably in our lives as Americans, born in America. And she never had that. And so I think her growth was stunted. Um, and 
I I recognize this now and I and I feel bad about it now. Um, you know, maybe when I was growing up, I would see other American moms working and maybe even being breadwinners and she wasn't. And I was like, why, why doesn't she want that for herself? But I think it's because she didn't have the support system that some other, the other others of us do. And I think that's not a small thing. And even within her community and culture, that wasn't modeled. So I think she just thought she was doing the best she could as long as her kids were doing well. That for her was the badge of honor. And so I always think as a the daughter of immigrants, if I'm ever at a moment where I'm feeling defeated or like tired or, you know, wanting to give up, I wonder, what is my excuse? What is my excuse? My parents came here with far less. They built a life for themselves and their children. Escaping a revolution. They escaped a revolution. And so I owe it to this legacy that they've created and now I'm living out to sort of see it through and also pass down these values to my children. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's very complex. And I think it is sad in in some ways, but also really endearing in others. And our parents did the best they could. They really did Um, with what they had, the the little network they had, the little resource, the few resources they had. And it's true. I mean, for growing up, it was never like, I hope you become a financial author or an entrepreneur. It was like, you should really go to law school. Or, you know, when I, even when I got into journalism school, it was received with a bit of skepticism, you know, like, even though I was like, mom, it's Columbia. Oh, okay. If it's Columbia, it's fine. You know, they, they were worried because, Again, I think it's just you're afraid of what you don't know. They didn't know that there might be another way to have their children re- achieve financial success beyond what they had experienced, beyond what they had seen modeled. And so, again, got to have a lot of compassion. I often hear from uh, children of immigrants who are now adults and maybe they had pursued the straight and narrow or like what their parents wanted them to do, which was they became um, doctors or lawyers or they worked at Google. <laughs> That's that's a fast way to an immigrant mom's heart is tell her you work at Facebook or Google and now they want to open a salon or they want to pursue the arts or they want to take a break and then figure things out. And they're terrified because of what this might, how this might be reflected back onto their parents and what that conversation is going to be like and immigrant parents. And I'm generalizing here, but I think, you know, it, they're a tough crowd. <laughs> Well, you mentioned there's something you said earlier kind of stuck out to me, which is that you think about what is my excuse when you look at what your yeah. parents did, which from the outside, you seem like the type of person, which I do recognize somewhat in myself, who puts an exorbitant level of pressure on yourself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, to succeed and to succeed by very specific standards and to have a real sort of, I guess a level of manifesting things that aligns with your vision for your life that I think 90% of people would not go for, like they would not even try, I think, you know, the, the aims that you have for yourself. And I wonder sometimes because my parents aren't immigrants, but they were, I was low income growing up, which I think does often manifest in similar things of what's your excuse. And you have these, you know, really kind of also is a sense of scarcity, a sense of pressure, a sense of needing to succeed at a certain level to achieve true sustainability. Um, But to what extent do you feel like that feeling of like, what's my excuse? I always must be striving for excellence is sort of robbing yourself of the ability to just live, you know, the life that so many people in this country were privileged to, they were never, they were privileged to never ask themselves those questions or put that level of pressure on themselves. It's such an important question. And I think that in my more recent years, I've had to catch myself to say like, it's okay to have fun. It's okay to do something because it's just easier that my dad, especially, uh, I think for him, and I think I grew up probably, um, I inherited this to some extent that, unless it's hard and unless it's a struggle, there's no valor in it. There's no honor in really? it. And even to this day, like if you ask my father, how's work going? And he goes right to sort of what's not working about mm. work so that he can kind of talk about the struggle. And But he's obsessed with it. He loves that. He loves like problem solving in his profession, but also in life. And I think he just is of that generation and era of, again, the the 
immigrant mentality. Like you come here with nothing and there's like a lot of pride in being able to build something out of nothing and all the work and struggle that goes into it. And so for me, it's um, like someone asked me the other day, what fiction books are you reading? And I was like, I have a really hard time escaping into fiction because I feel my sort of the daughter of my dad's brain is like, that's too fun. You need to be learning all the time. Yes, you need to be getting an ROI. It's my my dad's favorite acronym on everything. And so letting loose uh, has been something that I have to be more conscious of and like just being like, it's okay to just relax. It's okay to, and I do now, trust me, like I've gotten a lot better at this. Like I take naps during the day. I, I, Love a nap. I have, you know, silly shows that I watch. Um, I am reading fiction. I think that... It's also fine for me to want to do something that is just easier, even though maybe it doesn't make intellectual sense, uh, but it makes a lot of emotional sense for me. And I write about those things in the book. I, there was a episode in my life twice, actually, for each child that I chose not to breastfeed. Oh, yes, yes. And... My first was my first child was born nine years ago, and I, I'm so sorry for a second. Sorry. I was like, I thought you were about to say I chose not to have children. I was like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> we can talk about that. Um, so I'm telling the story about you know my my cho- my choice to not breastfeed, and it's not because I have cancer. It's not because I didn't have breast milk. It's not because of any um, thing that was wrong with me necessarily. I wasn't, you know, incapable of doing this. Um, I just chose not to because it was a lot easier for our family to to formula feed. I was not breastfed. And And I'm a genius. Yeah. So let's get that straight. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to use, I used to use myself and my husband as the example. I'm just going to use you as the example. Like, and also since you were born, the engineering of formula has gotten a lot better. So, Nevertheless, when I made this choice, I was so terrified to tell anybody outside of my home and my doctor's office that I was doing this because of the judgment and the backlash because I just felt like I, you know, I am choosing something that's easier and I don't think that's going to be respected. And also because there's a lot of opinion out there about formula versus breast milk and, you know, breast milk being best. And and even in the city where my kids were born, New York City, Mayor Bloomberg at the time had like just like thrown this huge campaign against formula. And he had told the nurses and the doctors at the pediatric wards to lock up the formula. And so you have that as well uh, happening. And so I felt very I was very scared to to talk about it, but I am okay to talk about it now because I think 10 years later, we're okay to talk about it. But also, like, I mean, just on such a core level, who gives a shit? Like, the amount of microplastics I consume today. Like, it just, I think there is such, especially in certain spaces with mothers. Now, I am child-free. It's mentioned in the book. We'll, we'll discuss it. But I used to be a nanny for very affluent families for a long time. And in those spaces, the more, you know, affluent communities and mothers within them, the hyper fixation on a total optimization of your child's development, rearing, all of that kind yeah. of stuff. Like, first of all, as someone who grew up low income, like we were just handed some sticks and put outside yes. to go entertain ourselves all day. And honestly, we were probably better for it. But also, and you know, 90s kids were raised on nothing but Kool-Aid and Cheetos bologna and, and bologna, like cereal. white bread, whatever. But also, like Every president we've ever had, I'm sure their mother smoked and drank while they were exactly. pregnant. Like I, like, do we really want to get into it? <laughs> do we? Yeah. Like, and I do think that there is this, and I, I probably, I imagine because for the first few years of deciding I didn't want children and dealing with some people in my life being not so cool about it, um, I similarly struggled with a feeling of like needing to defend and justify myself. But I do think that that feeling of unplugging from the matrix of like really understanding how few things are a really worth getting worked up about, but B how few people's opinions matter yeah. is like, until you get over that. Well, I was reminded of this story too, because when I was, when I was still pregnant and kind of looking, researching, you know, breast milk formula, et cetera, I would inevitably meet moms who had breastfed, who were like, it was the hardest thing I ever did. And they would almost say it like hard in what sense? Like, 
Well, it's exhausting, you know, and it's time consuming to breastfeed on demand, right? For your child, that's like, you're essentially a vessel, a food vessel for your kid in the first year. And so that means that everything gets delayed. Your um, ability to, you know, eat what you want, get back to your routines. I hear this, I heard this from a lot of moms that it was in some ways the most rigorous thing they have to do physically and mentally and it's hard I mean it hurts <laughs> in the beginning so I've heard uh and so and so I tried and I uh would always like question like why are they so miserable doing this and yet they're still doing this and and don't we want mo- I felt like again as a mom unless the struggle is real. You're not really momming, right? You know, like the more you struggle, the more you're a better parent, I guess. I don't know. Like that's the message that I was getting. And so when I chose to breastfeed, that was, there was shame attached to that for me that I didn't want people to know because then they would judge me as far as like how good of a mom I was, which I know is BS. Like my intelligent brain was like, that's BS. But I lived in Brooklyn. <laughs> it was <laughs> oh, no. Park Slope. Okay. Close. Close uh, to Park Slope. Yeah. So. Yeah. Those moms. I mean, it was it was a stressful. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel judged by them and I don't even have a kid walking by. I mean, I was getting judged in the hospital when I asked for formula. So by baby number two, I just brought my own. Yep. Do okay. That. Okay. But also, and I'm sure like the little Astrid and Kenzie and all of the, yeah. But listen, I, I think it's totally right. And I would probably have, like I said, a similar thing, but I do think one of the bigger, like it really bothers me that there's not that macro analysis of choices like this, which obviously you do talk about in this book and your work as kind of looking at it from a more broad financial and kind of sociocultural level, which is like not to bring it into the Eve Rodsky of it all, but like part of the issue with breastfeeding for women today is like in a ideal environment where we have super comprehensive maternity leave right. and women are able to take a year to focus on being a mother as mm. they do in many civilized countries. Mm-hmm. Um, and husbands were equal partners right. in, in hetero marriages the concept of breastfeeding would be completely different because right now in many dynamics, when we already have these dynamics, no guaranteed maternity leave, women taking on the majority of child rearing, even when they work full-time jobs, creating a situation or being in a situation where you are physically tied to that child in a way that your male partner is not like, I hope that for every marriage that the man is making Herculean efforts to overcome that, but nine times out of 10, they are not. And that's really for us, why it was easiest. It wasn't just because mom wants to get back to her workout routine and eat like, you know, whatever she wants to eat. It's because I ran a business and I wanted to get back to the business because I was the breadwinner as soon as I could physically and mentally. And when you're breastfeeding constantly, you're, there's a lot of interruption and, um, and, let al- like let alone working for a company. How hard is that? I mean, it was hard enough working from home, trying to breastfeed and finding the time and trying to tend to the business. When I uh, when we used formula, it made it so that my husband and I could feed our baby equally. Yeah, and we could change. We could one night he was on duty and the other night I was on duty, and it wasn't all on my shoulders on my shoulders to be this food vessel for my kid. Well, listen, like I said in the beginning, I was not breastfed. And I'm not even going to say I'm fine. I'm Unfollow great. Unfollow me. <laughs> I'm great. <laughs> so as many of you might know, shopping for high-quality evergreen wardrobe items is really important to me. But spending the insane amount of money that they often cost is not something I'm trying to do when building out my wardrobe. I discovered Quince earlier this year and have genuinely recommended it to so many people. I have bought so many Quince items with my own money. Fun fact, I'm not wearing a Quince top today, but only literally because the all of the ones I have are either dirty and in the laundry because I wear them so frequently or they're packed because I'm leaving tomorrow for a short trip and they're like in my A-list clothes that always get packed. But suffice it to say, I have become a Quince girly this year. And if you want to take a look at me in one of my favorite Quince blouses... Here I am in all my glory. But as we talk about many times here at TFD, we are all about cost per use. You are much better off investing a little bit upfront in something that can be worn again and again than in paying bottom barrel prices for something that you will end up having to replace almost immediately. And with Quince, you get those investment level pieces without having to pay exorbitant investment level prices. All of Quince's prices are 50 to 80% less than similar brands. They partner directly with top factories to cut out the cost of the middleman and pass the savings on to you. 
Quince creates timeless classics that never go out of style, and you'll have them in your closet forever. This includes all of the capsule wardrobe must-haves like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50 or washable silk tops and dresses, my personal favorites. But as I mentioned, I am a quince girly through and through now, and having bought many high quality pieces in my wardrobe at literally like three or four times the price of my quince items, I can genuinely say that the quince items are as good or better than the stuff that I overpaid for. So be like me and get affordable luxury with quince. Go to quince.com slash TFC for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash TFC and get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash TFC. If you're living in 2023 and you're on the internet, your data, very personal data, is probably available to everyone who's ready to pay for it. And it's kind of scary. As someone who has personally been on the internet for over 10 years at this point, like I was pretty shocked to find out when I did my first Delete Me report, like just how much of my personal information was available out there. Like they did their first report and I had my data removed from literally 61 different data broker websites in just the first report. Um, And that's information like, my full name, my home address, my phone number, which is honestly terrifying. Because there are companies out there called data brokers whose entire job is to collect huge amounts of your personal info, like your name, address, phone number, social security number, and even information about your relatives, which is all then sold online kind of insane. But the good news is that this is where Delete Me comes in to help you. Delete Me protects your data from data brokers, reducing the risk of identity theft, scams, and those annoying spam emails and calls that we all get. Their software and team of experts will not just find and remove your personal information from hundreds of data broker websites, but they'll continuously scan for new data that shows up and get that removed as well. Instead of you spending hours of your time figuring out how to remove this data, Delete Me does it for you. Before you get into a panic, take control of your data by signing up for Delete Me. It's super easy to use and it simply works. And they offer a special discount for our listeners. Get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash TFC and use promo code TFC. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash TFC and enter promo code TFC at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash TFC, promo code TFC. You mentioned before we started filming that you are looking forward and you want to do more things outside of talking about money, which is something that I think about all the time um, and have been doing lately, uh, which honestly only reinforces my love for talking about money when you feel like you can do other things. Um, But you come from a different background in the sense of you're a journalist by Mm -hmm. trade, which I think puts, and rightfully so, right? Like a higher standard of kind of seriousness um, about your approach to things much more, um, you know, there's always that, you know, real sensitivity about like not speaking outside of expertise, Mm -hmm. not speaking about issues in a more casual or editorial way. Um, And so in terms of, you know, thinking about what you want to do next with not just your career, but like your life, what is, what are the questions that you're asking yourself to direct yourself to where you want to go when it's such a substantial departure from anything Mm. you've done prior or have been trained for? My goodness. I, first of all, yes, I want to do a lot more outside of personal finance. And I'm hoping that this book will be a bridge to do that. I think like similar to your book, there's potential adaptation. You know, who knows? Prayers up. Healthy state of panic, the one woman show. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm having a lot of fun and that's a little new for me. And it's like, how can I leverage this enthusiasm and fun and like before I wrote this book I was doing stand-up comedy for a little bit uh which is if you read the epilogue you'll learn about that I cannot believe is there a YouTube evidence yes <gasps> YouTube it oh my gosh <laughs> get the to well you're already on YouTube get the to so, the YouTube or you're on Spotify possibly or, or wherever and you're actually listen, but. it's what inspired the book in some ways And I've always, you know, you said journalism was my first profession and that's true, but I had a whole life in theater as well before I started working in journalism. I did theater since I was like a little girl and then all the way through college. But my parents being, you know, my parents, they were like, you're not, that's not a serious profession. You need to be a serious person. Um, They were on the cast of uh, Succession. (laughs) You're not serious people. And so I was like, I'm going to be serious. I'm going to be a serious journalist. And actually, I wanted to be a a war reporter. I wanted to be an international war correspondent. Picked money instead, which has has its own conflicts. But 
a little, that. A little safer, I guess. Keeps you keeps your boots on the ground. And anyway, I think I would like to do work in more creative spaces like theater, a stage. One of the things I'm definitely going to do in the new year is more speaking, which is going to, I've written this like 30 minute talk that's a bit, uh, takes on different characters. There's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of Farnoosh, lessons. My goodness. Um, come your improv era. Coming to a stage <laughs> near you. And the question that I ask, I guess what I try to keep at the forefront as I'm looking at, you know, what's worth doing next and what can I do next is like. There's a picture that I've been keeping of myself in my office of when I was four or five years old. Yeah. And I recommend everybody do this because I think there's something um, really wonderful about remembering who you were as a kid and what this kid really wanted. And when there were no there were there were no objections, there was no interference, there was no there was a lot of naivete potentially, but just the the innocence of that. Sure. I think. Um, can't hurt to remember. And I always think like, you know, do it for her, do it for her, that, you know, little Farnoosh, little Chelsea, um, and, you know, keeping her with me as I'm now navigating this next stage of my life. Um, I think we are always quick to wanting to become grown ups. We want to run away from that little girl for, a, you know, I always wanted to be like an adult woman. You know, I always hear you talking about how you like, you I hated being a child. Yeah, hated. Yeah. Hated. And, and so now here we are. And I think that um, we've accomplished a lot. We're, we're women with a capital W. And I think giving a nod to that little girl, right, uh, is, is, is very, for me, it's been a great motivating tool to, to get out there and do interesting things and to uh, live up to maybe her hopes and dreams more than maybe 25 year old Farnoosh's hopes and dreams. What was eight year old, seven year old Farnoosh wanting to do? That's real. I mean, I also always feel the need to specify when I say I hated being a child <laughs> that I had a, I had good parents. I had a great, whatever, like I had all the ingredients for, I just hated the feeling of being a child. I had such a feeling of like, why do I have to do what other people say? Mm -hmm. Why can I, you know, I, I hated even like wearing kids clothes. I, I just wanted to be an adult. That being said, I do think that what you're talking about with honoring sort of what your childhood self would have wanted, that's kind of how I feel when I like surround my media consumption and social media consumption with much, much older women. Yeah. Because they're like, all these women I follow, they are in a renaissance. Like they are having like third, fourth careers, third, fourth husbands in many cases. Like they're living in a way that I think is just really speaks to that idea of like, you get many lives and you get many iterations of yourself. And I do think that for a lot of women, certainly of our mother's generations, but even looking around at women who are my peers, I think that very few of them, not very few, but a lot of them don't give themselves the pleasure and the, you know, indulgence of mm -hmm. just simply asking like, what do I enjoy? What do I want? Who am I? Especially mm -hmm. when they're kind of pushed into an identity of, you know, we don't give a lot of space to mothers in particular, but women as they age generally, yeah. we don't give a lot of space to them to think of them as interesting individuals. We're caregivers. We're caregivers. We're caretakers. My mother now, I know I said earlier that she never had that person who was like, what do you want? And how can I help you? She's now that person for herself uh, in her well, we're young. We're, we're only 19 years apart. So she's in her 60s and she's living her best life. Queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Queen. Um, so when you talk about in. OK, so in the book, there is that little um, passage uh, in the FOMO chapter about, you know, choosing not to have kids and kind of mm -hmm. navigating that choice and things like that. Um, when you look back at the choices that you've made, um, obviously, you know, some you're incredibly fulfilled by and happy with. But do you think like there are certain choices that you've made that you think I, I probably made that out of the wrong kind of fear? Hmm. Wow. It's so crazy because I feel like th things have worked out for me, you know, so yeah. it's hard to like go back and go, I shouldn't have done that. Or it's not like I have regret, but I've been a really good parlayer. So maybe yeah. initially I get into something because it's what my dad wanted or it's because the FOMO that my mother had of, you know, and so I just went with their energy and I arrive and I'm like, 
like a clear example is I studied finance in college. This was after many semesters of not knowing what the hell I wanted to do. I started out in political science because I thought I should become a lawyer because that's what my parents wanted. And I'm I'm good. At, I could I could have been a good lawyer. Like, let's just be honest. Like, I could have I figured it there, out. I mean, there's a lot of mediocre lawyers out there. So you could have been a lawyer. Let's I we mean, could all be lawyers. For sure. For sure. And then I said, no, this is not it. And then um, I really had to figure it out. Otherwise, at this point, I was probably going to be in college for six years because you have to figure things out. You got to get your courses in, in order and in action. And so my dad was like, why don't you just major in business? And so when I was in the business school, I, I landed on finance because my dad, again, said, pick a major with an ROI. You're going to college. We're paying for your college. It was Penn State, which they could cash flow out of their um, – their paychecks. My parents did not want me to take out student loans, which thank God. But they were like, as a result, we're going to, have to go somewhere that's like cheap. So yeah, that was Penn State. Well, he's not wrong on the ROI things. No, yeah, that was college. great. But then I, I was like, what more of an ROI is there than studying finance? Right, right, right. right. You graduate, you get the highest salary, uh, and you learn how to make money. And so I did that. But my first internship that in uh, was at CNBC in their sales department, and. I realized, like, I don't want to be on this side of the equation. I want to be where the reporters are and the storytellers are. Everywhere around the office, they were airing CNBC and MSNBC. I was in 30 Rock at the time. This was, like, 1999. And I thought, I really don't want to be an Excel spreadsheet monkey. Like, I really yeah. don't. I don't. Even though it's lu more lucrative and more of a straight path. But I kind of want to go on the other side of this wall and and be live on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or, you know, break incredible stories about business and the economy. And so that was the parlay. I was like, I got here. This was kind of a mistake, a kind of a mistake. But how can I make the most of it? How can I leverage this moment in time, this experience, where I am to, to like go get closer to what it is that actually is more me? And it was... While I was there, I um, I went to visit different uh, universities like Columbia and NYU, got to know their, their media programs or journalism programs. I network with some of the, uh, the reporters. Like I had access, right? So it's like take advantage. And then I went back to school, did not pivot my major, but started to get some of the other experiences that I knew would help me to qualify for graduate school for journalism. So I did my thesis in media studies. I got internships in journalism, subsequent summers, and just made a case for becoming a financial journalist, which I didn't know was going to be my end all, but I was like, that's how I'm going to get into these schools. I need a story. I need to create a narrative around what I'm doing that makes sense so they can accept me and I can be on my way doing more of what I want to do, which is be a storyteller and be more creative. Um, and also like paying respect to my, my roots. Like my parents wanted me to be a finance major. Fine. You know, let's, we're going to weave that in too. But I parlayed that. It's aspirational. You say you don't have regrets. I feel like I have so many. I don't know. What's, what, what's, I have a section on regrets in my chap, in my book. Uh, Dan Pink wrote a great book called The Power of Regret. It's like our culture is so obsessed with no regrets, you know. And well, that's what I think. It's like I feel like if you don't feel at least sometimes an acute sense of like, well, that was a flop. I should not have done that. Or like I mean, that was a waste of time. I think it's time. very intelligent to say like I regret that because there's a lot to learn from our regrets. I don't know. I just feel like I don't have time to like go back in time and, and be like I should have done it this way or that way. Like it is what it is. Things make me sad. I grieve. And maybe that's. A sign of regret. Yeah. But I, I call it different things. I call it, you know, that was unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> that was unfortunate. Um, I feel like I more regret like the way I navigate, like the way the way I was in situations and the way I navigate things. Cause I used to be a much, much worse person. Um it's much harsher, much more impatient, much more and I used to like I used to have like my sense of this is like one of the many, many reasons I should never have a child. I would be a terrible mother. I'd like, I would be very, uh, Sounds like you'd be all like all mothers. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I would be like certain specific mothers that I've known throughout my life. Not my own. Um, my, my mom was actually very, very accepting, um, and, and open-minded in a way I think a lot of mothers are not. Um, but for me, my sense of like my very heightened sense of needing to control outcomes 
and having specific expectations mm-hmm. would overflow onto other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for me, like, I don't know, what is your relationship to therapy, if you don't mind sharing? I've never been to a therapist except for my son has a therapist and we see her occasionally as a family. That is shocking to me. You seem like someone who's had like good therapy in your life. Thank you. I, <laughs> it's true. I think that I've done a lot of work on myself uh, in terms of really like, well, it's really like the the whole like relationship with fear that I've um, learned to have that is, um, for me, the, f- the fear was so overwhelming at one point. It was where I wouldn't want to go to work and I would be on like my bathroom floor, like stomach aches, like the anxiety, it was like manifesting very physically in my body. Sleep issues? Sleep issues, stomach ache issues, so many issues. I would go to all the gastroenterologists and they're like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I'm a television producer in New York. They're like, yeah, that's part of the job. I was like, "Mm, I think there's a better way. There has to be a better way. Um, So I, you know, I I thank you. I I guess, I, I don't think I don't need a therapist. I think we can all (laughs) (laughs) benefit from professional help. And maybe I will one day turn to that. But I think I've, um, I was, I've been so independent and so not alone as I felt very much connected to people around me, but you know, I've been very solo preneuring my life for so long that there's been a lot of self-reflection. There's been a lot of self-talk and, you know, checking in and just I think I do though have a really good sense of myself I don't know if that's something that I just you're born with or not because you know people who like don't have a good sense of themselves like they they walk into a meeting and they're like I think that went great and I'm like really <laughs> that went terribly <laughs> and it was your fault you know but it was I just feel like people people have said this about me where they're like you know when to joke and you know when to not joke and you know when to like get serious and not like you can really read a room. And I will say why that may be is because we moved around a lot when I was growing up. Yeah. And I was constantly the new girl. Not only that, I was the new girl with the unusual name and a background that was unlike anybody else's. And so I have had to learn quickly on my feet how to connect with people and Kind of swim all circles. Swim all circles. Know yourself really well. Get Be good with yourself because you're going to walk into rooms where people won't want you there and they will reject you. So I've had an early, early uh, relationship with things like loneliness and rejection. And I think that, you know, I didn't ask for that, but that's how my life panned out. And it's, it's I guess, manifested now as an adult woman where I really know myself. That's awesome that you were, because I needed considerable therapy Um, and I'm so much the better for it, but it is, it's really good that you were able to come to that kind of on your own and identify what sounds like, I mean, what you describe as being a pretty extreme level of anxiety and kind of walk your way back from it. Again, I think because as a kid, I had to read the rooms a lot Yeah, and I, I'm a really good I think, not always, but I think I can read people pretty well. But the benefit of that is really that you get to see the best qualities in people and what you want to emulate. Like I've had a lot of role models who've never met me, but I just observe them because I read their work. I see them on TV or I watch them online or I've heard great stories about them. And I, um, yeah, I mean, like, for, for a long time, I think growing up, it was always like, who am I going to be when I grow up? You know, we all have that question, like, what's going to be my life? Like, what's going to be my take on things? And how am I going to walk through life? And I, that for me was always a constant uh, exploration and journey. And and to get there, I think I've benefited from just observing and being curious. Well, on the note of like what I'm going to be, and this is like honestly a genuine question for me as someone who walks this fine line the difference between I know what I want and I'm going to make it happen and mm-hmm. I'm going to be that person versus accepting to some extent that life is beyond your control and being content with whatever it happens to be. Like, do you have practices that have allowed you to achieve a better balance with that? Well, I, and I would like for this to be a fear that my children have, which is that the world is imperfect. Things will not work out for you. Just when you think you've done everything right and you've gone to school and you've studied hard and you've shown up early and like 
you know, you might still not get the job. You still might not get the promotion. You still might not get the house. You still might not get the money and, and or uh, a call back. And I, again, because I've had a lot of early experiences with rejection, um, I'm always ready for that. And how I prepare is I do the work that I can do. I control what I can control, but I always have a good plan B or C. Or I find for myself, it's like, what what's like bare bones contentment? You know, like we were buying a home in New Jersey in the pandemic or we, you know, we were hoping we could. And then we made an offer and my husband and I, we were like, this could totally fall through the cracks. This could, we could even buy it and get there and be like, what have we done and want to sell it? So we need to get real solid with another way, a fallback that we would be just as content, you know, experiencing than this home. And maybe that's renting an apartment for a few years until we get our bearings and, and move into another direction. And I'm like, well, that's fine. Like for us, it was like the most important thing is that we're out of Brooklyn, we're together, the kids are safe, wherever we end up, we end up. I think that's one of the benefits of growing up with not a lot. My husband also comes from humble beginnings. Like we know what, we know what, we know how to survive. Yeah, we do. And that's something that again, as a mom, I'm conscious of wanting, we want to provide for our kids, but you also want to you want to create obstacles for them, you know, in, in, in like within boundaries, you know, like you're not going to get everything. You will have a job, you know, you're not going to get a car right away. You're not going to, um, and I'm going to tell you like great job, but that doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily, you know, win the race. Like, you know, that there's always obstacles in life. And my mother also put the fear of God in me as far as like financial stuff. Like when she dropped me off at college, she was like, we're not, <laughs> Don't get into any credit card debt because, like, we're not your fallback for that. She had a lot of foresight. I was like, what do you mean credit card debt? We stand a prudent queen. Um, yeah. As a last note, you mentioned, you know, inculcating certain fears in your children. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something I'm fascinated by. I recently did a podcast, a French podcast, about money mostly, but we also talked about children. And I had joked on it. This kicked off a bit of a <laughs> bit of a kerfuffle in the in-law group chat. Um, they don't speak English, so they won't hear about this. But um, because I like jokingly said um, that like my children would be assholes um, because uh, I mean, just like an obscene. Uh, well, first of all, I'd, sh I'd ship them off to boarding school because I don't want to be a mother, but also yeah. um, truly, but also um it's it was a facetious comment, but the intent of it was to say, like, sometimes I think about the life that I live and the person that I am and how much that was informed from coming from uh, a humble background economically, from having these constraints put on me externally, um, from having a family that had to be very enterprising and very humble in all of their decision making and all of these things. And sometimes I think, you know, when you have obviously the American dream is to have so much more than you grew up with mm -hmm. and then to pass that along to your children. But then I always wonder, do people who don't come from much and then have a lot to give their children ever think like, how do I give them a wonderful oh, yeah. life without creating little monsters? I mean, like the kids on succession. And to be yeah. fair, well, again, like as a nanny for some really affluent families, like I'm like, I check in on those kids sometimes and I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> we might have gotten some right. assholes in the bunch. But it's understandable, too, because at a certain level of wealth and access and privilege and without the sort of counterbalancing factors from parents who are very conscientious about that, it's totally understandable that they would end up that way. Yeah, it's a, you have to be extremely proactive and conscious about having those conversations with your kids and modeling that for your kids. I'm not nothing against going out in life, doing well, creating a, a comfortable life for your family and your kids. That's what we all want, right? Like, of course, I want that for everybody. But there has to be with that an understanding of where this all comes from and how life is fragile and reminding your kids of like what your core values are, which in our family is like service and, you know, being good people, being good citizens. And I don't think kids are getting those conversations regularly, right? They're not getting, they're not getting access to those kinds of deeper discussions. It's, it's, and I'll be the first to admit, it's not like a daily thing. You know, it's like my son asked me the other day, 
he's nine, he said, are we rich or are we poor? Ooh, interesting. Yeah. What'd you say? And I, well, my advice for anybody who's fronted with that question from a child is to not answer it right away. Ask them a question mm. and say, what makes you curious? Because sometimes that can just nip it in the bud. Like maybe they're just curious because they overheard a conversation at school that, you know, and it's nothing personal. It's just like maybe the kids were using those words at school and they kind of want to like understand it more. Or in our case, we had just come home from hanging out with these new friends of his. Uh, the parents had invited us over. It was a camp friend. We were meeting everybody for the first time. I was meeting everybody for the first time. My sons were, fr- my son and their son were friends. We go over to their house. It's like, it's a mansion. It's just like multi levels, giant pool. It was like this game room that just like kept going with like multiple toys and all that. My kids didn't want to leave. And when we got home, my son was like, Are we rich like that? Like, I don't understand. He was like, Why don't we have a house like that? Can we have a house like that? I want a game room like that. And I was like, First of all, we have a very nice house. I said, You know, at the end of the day, I said, Evan, what, what equals rich? It's a little bit of money. Of course, money matters, but it's also what you choose to do with that money, how you feel. Like, I feel very rich. Your dad and I feel super rich and super lucky that we get to have the life that we have. And the reason we have the life that we have is because we're making choices. You know, everybody has their amount of money and probably your friend's parents have more money than us, but that's okay. You know, like that's going to happen. Some people are going to have more, some people are going to have less, some people are going to have the same. But the important thing to remember is that your life is a series of decisions to an extent. And I said, if you want to go out there and one day have a game room in your home, then you should and you can, but not right now because <laughs> we're the ones so, making the decisions. That is so interesting. Yeah, but, I mean. Yeah, go ahead. It's not, I don't think I gave the perfect answer, but I think that uh, had my parents been on the receiving end of that question when I was a kid, it would have just been like, which means shut up <laughs> in Farsi, you know, or like it, yeah. some sort of like dismiss. And instead I wanted to engage him because I think ultimately these conversations are healthy. They're going to be imperfect, but we're talking about money, which is more than I think a lot of families do. They don't talk about money. Oh yeah. So at least we're talking about it. Yeah. I had so- several of the children I nannied for ask me if they were rich. Um, like, and I asked my, I remember I asked my aunt if we were poor when I was a kid, because I think probably a lot of kids ask their parents something similar and they don't get, I think they might say what your parents said to you, which is like, absolutely not. Like I'm not entertaining this. And so they'll ask other people. Um, but I, it's, I always wondered because I never asked my parents directly that question about our money. Cause I knew like there were money problems and like, I knew it was like a sort of negative ambiance over, over everything, but I didn't like. I didn't dare ask them directly because I felt like that, I don't know, maybe it's rude or would be invasive. Yeah, it's, it's a loaded, it can feel like a really loaded question when you're on the receiving end of it, especially if you have a tendency to think that what you make is what you're worth and that your what you have in your bank account says anything about, you know, your ability to work hard and be smart, which is crock of shit but you know that's what people think that's what sometimes people think and like they don't want to have that conversation because they're worried that like if if you know they talk about it it's going to reveal things about themselves that that they don't like well listen i'm not going to gaslight everyone i feel rich um (laughs) (laughs) uh no i think that's a i don't think there's any good because the thing is even if you did say to your kid yeah yeah we're pretty well off they're going to go repeat that to their friends. Right. Well, yeah. Or like, good thing he didn't, I mean, he could have also asked like, how much do you make? That's probably going to come like, that's ne- that's the next supper. I don't know. But it's, you know, the best thing to do is just kind of keep the dialogue going. You, do you put it out there what you, what you earn? No. Okay. I think, you know. Some people do. Some people in I, our space do. I, I do. That. Like some people do. I, I know. I appreciate when people do, but I have not had great experiences with, um, my income transparency and not even like on the internet, but with amongst a negotiation even, you know, where I was renegotiating a deal and the woman on the other end of it knew how much I had made previously and basically was like, we're not going to give you more because we think you're making enough and not like enough because this is what the project is valued at. And it was like, because you should be happy with what you have. And I think it's 
complex. I think that, um, listen, I talk about what I make. If you want to talk about that after the show, we'll talk about <laughs> it. But I'm not putting it on the internet. Like, I just don't. I, I will happily have, and I do have many conversations with others in my world who are after the same sorts of things like brand partnerships or speaking engagements or book deals, and we talk about it. But I think, um, unfortunately, the world is not like this kumbaya place where you yeah. can put that out there and think that everyone's going to be celebrating it and yeah. won't use it against you. It's why employers are not allowed in many states now to ask prospective hires, what is your salary history? It's important to note, by the way, for when people are, yeah. Yeah, because not they, they're that. not using it to be like, well, we're going to give you 50% more. They're like, oh, we're going to give you exactly what you just made or maybe a dollar more, but that's about it. Also, in most states, you can't be fired for talking about what you earn with other mm. uh, employees. That's not like a grounds for termination. But just for the record, I don't expect that everyone should do that. Everyone has to have their own relationship to it. But it is, uh, you know, something to, to consider, especially, you know, if your son could potentially just Google, what does my mom make one day? <laughs> I mean, it's I I my net worth is over seven figures. And I'm actually I was asked to write an article about, um, you know, I wanted to contribute a piece about my book to a website and we, I was pitching ideas and she was like, what if we call the title of the story, how I became a millionaire? And I was like, oh, I don't know, but okay, if that's what the click, that's what the bait's going to be fine. But I mean, technically it's true, but I don't want to, it's like almost Thanksgiving. I don't want to like have, you know, everyone. <laughs> also, I mean, listen, let's be very clear. That. We, the, the country overall has a severe problem with low income and that is clearly the major issue. That being said, a million dollars is what the average person needs to just live a basic retirement. So being a quote unquote millionaire, I think has a very different connotation yeah. um, to what it actually entails in in, in practice. Honestly, I feel like I have a ways to go. I have I still need to save more money for my retirement. And um, but millionaire has carries a certain there's a, there's a lot there that is left for interpretation. Well, listen, Farnoosh, I deeply appreciate you stopping by. You have an event. You're third in New York. Your third event tonight in New York. I'm sure you are blowing up inside with anxiety about the evening. I My would feet be. hurt. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Where can people buy your book? Well, you can go to ahealthystateofpanic.com and learn all about where it's available. And I have a podcast called So Money, which you've been on many times. I have. And it's three days a week. And I love Instagram. That's my watering hole. You gotta get over to TikTok. Right? Oh, and you're doing you're doing so. I just like watching you on TikTok. You're very sweet. I love <laughs> making TikToks. I thought I would hate it, and yet here you're I am. So good at addicted. It. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and thank you guys for tuning in. And we will see you next week on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Goodbye, guys. Mm -hmm.